Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you all this day. Thank you so much for uh, being at Living Hope Wesleyan Church today. It's a joy to, to be with you, and I'm really, really excited about what, uh, what we have in store for you today. Uh, first things first, a couple of announcements for you. Welcome. We're glad you're here. We have a couple of things that we would love it if you would do for us. We have a thing called the Digital Connection Card. It is located on our church website, lhwc.net. And make sure you click the, um, the plugins. That's our, your um, subtle like picture to get plugged in. Uh, you, you saw that, didn't you? You knew that. That's what it's all about, but we're glad that, uh, that you might be able to do that today. Um, something else that you need to know is that last week, we had what is called our local church conference. And a local church conference is basically our uh, church business meeting with elections and with some other things that are going on, uh, reports of all sorts. And those packets are available for you if you would like to take one with you. They're located at the welcome table as you uh, came in today. And as you exit, you can grab one as well. Also, there's a financial uh, information there uh, for your uh, reading pleasure if you are a numbers person. And that's, uh, you can enjoy that. So uh, the reason why we make that available is because we know that not everybody can be here for that meeting. But we want you to be aware of what is going on and what's happening and all the fun stuff that, uh, that Living Hope uh, has been experiencing over this last year. So uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, the, the last thing that I want to do, I'm going to do two things with this, but um, this last week we had some kids that uh, went to middle school camp. There was five uh, kids from our church, and there's a couple of them that are present here today. Uh, there's three of them. I've seen Josh, I've seen Jeremiah, and I've seen Hudson. And I don't think, am I, am I, I know that if I always say names that I'm going to miss somebody, but I don't think I see anybody else. But I uh, want you to do this and do me a favor, okay? Um, these guys had a wonderful week at camp, and they want to talk about it. At least I hope they do. So my encouragement for you is to maybe remind them that you've been praying for them all week long. And maybe you might take some time today and chat with them and talk to them about what they experienced at camp. And maybe the question that you can ask, guys, I'm giving you a precursor, okay? So if everybody asks this question about what your favorite thing about camp was, then you get to answer it and you get to use the same answer every single time, okay? Jeremiah, Josh, Hudson, that was your tip, okay? That's your tip for the, uh, the, the answer that people might give you. Um, but anyways, they had a great experience, but we also have kids that are leaving today for high school camp, and there's 11 teenagers from our, our church that are going, and uh, that's really exciting. So uh, what, what is it that is our responsibility? The, you guys did better than last week. Good job. Last week we had like a person that said, pray, maybe, maybe. But yes, it is prayer. We need to be praying for uh, the teens that go to camp, uh, the high schoolers that are going to be there. And I hope that this week you will intercede for them like no other because you already did it once and it was a phenomenal week. And I, I know that God's going to honor those prayers and I know that he will answer them. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we've got 11. That's, uh, that's a good number of kids that are going down. Uh, would you be praying for them? And let's see, would you uh, join me in praying for them right now? Okay, let's do that. Father God, we realize that uh, camp is such a big thing. There's a lot that goes into it. And we are so grateful that we have an opportunity to send on to camp uh, 11 teens today, an opportunity for them to hear more about what you have in store for their lives when it comes to their relationship with you and how you want to challenge them. There will be some, Lord, that will be at camp and they do not know you. And I pray that they would have a very clear picture of who you are and how you can change their life because of your transforming power of your Holy Spirit and the way that you work in people's lives. We pray, Father, that uh, not only will there be safety and there will be uh, plenty of activity and fun, but there, there would be a worship experience that is like no other. 
that there is a learning opportunity to to hear your words spoken to them that would challenge them and change the way that they live. But also, Lord, will you just do the work that you want to do in these kids' lives? It would be very easy for us to pray how we want things to go, but we just offer it to you and say, God, you work. You know what's best. You know what needs to be done. You know what each teenager needs to hear this week. And we pray that it would be so. We pray that your hand of mercy would be upon them, that the week would be like no other. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, thank you so much for doing that. And, you know, as I was uh, kind of preparing for this week, I realized that today is Father's Day. And I thought, you know, um, what better day than to than Father's Day to have some dad jokes? So in honor of all the dads uh, that are corny like me, uh, here's some dad jokes just for you, okay? Why did the baby strawberry cry? His parents were in a jam. How, how do you follow Will Smith in the snow? You follow the fresh prince. Too soon? Too soon? Yeah, probably. Probably too soon on that one. Okay. All right. How does a sprinter eat? Or no, excuse me. What does a sprinter eat before race day? Nothing. They fast. Why don't pirates take a bath before they walk the plank? Because they'll wash up on shore later. It's, it's not like these are mine. I did not make these up. Okay? All right. All right. You can't make, be making comments that nobody else can hear. Um, why can't your nose be 12 inches long? I'll finish it. Be because it would be a foot. Okay. Okay, this one, you, I, I feel like we're going to have another of those instances where you answer it. So, so do me the favor of letting me get to the punchline. Okay, all right? Okay. Why did the dad toss the clock out the window? He wanted to see time fly. Okay. All right, so I'm going to just go fast now because you guys are taking all my thunder. Uh, what did one toilet say to the other? You look flushed. All right, now this one, this one, this one, uh, we might have to end with this one because I really like this one. What did the drummer dad name his twin girls? And a one and a two. And come on, yeah, see, see, there we go. Are we, you guys picked that one up. It took a little bit, it took a little bit for you. Okay. Um, okay. Why did the golfer bring two pairs of socks in case he had a hole in one? You were close, Janice. You were close. Okay. This, we're going to finish this, this one, I think. Um, what does a busy body pepper do? It gets jalapeno in your business. Jalapeno in your business. Jalapeno business. No? no? Uh, uh, give us another one. Okay. All right. 
Okay, all right. I do have like three or four more, but we're gonna we'll stand with this one. Why did the scarecrow win an award? Because it was outstanding in the field. Oh, uh, boo on that one, huh? Goodness. Dads, thank you for the influence that you have in your families. Thanks for the way that you love. Thanks for the way that you lead. And thanks for the way that you point the way to Jesus. That's the best gift that you can do. That's the best thing that you can do in all your life. And love your family. Love your spouse. So thank you for that. Uh, Father, let's just pray. Father God, we are grateful that we get an opportunity to dig into your word today. We're grateful for it. We love it. We love the way that you work in our lives, and we are so grateful. We pray that you would speak to us today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We are starting a new sermon series that is titled, Suit Up. And I have this image of a lot of different things in my, uh, my mind as we think about this, but um, I am a uh, superhero movie kind of guy. I really enjoy them. I loved it in the very first Avengers movie. I don't know if anybody else is uh, superhero movie guys or girls or gals or whatever you want to say. Does, do people say gals anymore? That seems like a 1990s term and they want that back, um, but... I don't know. Anyways, um, Captain America, he's getting ready to go to like to the big battle scene. And he tells uh, Hawkeye and uh, Black Widow, he says, you got a suit? Suit up. And ever since I saw that, I have always been kind of like, yeah, I love those moments where there's this suit up montage of uh, different things. And I think I think it goes all the way back to Superman the very first movie with Christopher Reeves when he very first pulls his uh, shirt across and you just see that big S standing on his chest. There's no uh, CGI. There's just Christopher Reeves and all of his superness. And it's just amazing. It, I don't know what you're laughing at. Okay. I know that I do not look like Christopher Reeves at all. But if I ever do this again, you should be like cheering because I'm like, yeah. No, I'm not going to do it again. Um, Now, there are so many things within our world that we have like a uniform. We have a, a portion of our life where there is a dress code, even if it's unofficial or official, there is a dress code when you work. There's a uniform that something should be worn. And even in the life of a pastor, there are times where I have to suit up. Maybe I'm actually wearing a suit. That is like the epitome of me suiting up. Um, But in every area of life, athletes have to suit up. Did you know that jockeys have to suit up? They have to wear that that helmet on their head. They have to wear the the silks. But did you know that they also have to choose the proper goggles for the way that the race is going to be ran that day? Okay, I lived in Kentucky, and we lived over near uh, Lexington, Kentucky, where there is some big uh, racehorse tracks and just uh, amazing, beautiful places. But... uh, We also lived there when the uh, Kentucky Derby was going around. And one particular year when the Kentucky Derby was being run, the racetrack was a sloppy mess. And they did an interview with the riders, the jockeys. And basically, they put on about six or seven goggles over their eyes and just build them up after one after another. So that if one gets dirty, they pull it down so that the next one is ready to go. Because if they're not in the lead, guess what's happening to them? All the dirt is getting kicked up in their faces, on their horses' faces, and just all over them. So when it gets dirty, pull it down. And that's why sometimes at the end of a race, you'll see like six or seven goggles around their neck. Because they have to be suited up in order to make the ride for 
the roses. That, that, that's what you're going for when you're riding in the Kentucky Derby. Football players have to have their right uniform, right? They, it has to match. It has to have all the pieces and all the, all the shoulder pads and the helmet and all that stuff. And you know what they can't do? They can't take somebody else's helmet, especially in the professionals or in the college realm, because that helmet is suited just for them. Now, you might not think this, but soccer has to have a proper uniform. But because we think soccer, they don't have to have anything out there except shorts and a t-shirt, right? No, they have to have the right shirt, the right shorts, the matching socks, and they have to have shin guards on. If they don't have shin guards on, they don't play. Referees have a uniform. And what do we call them? Uh, in football, the, the striped zebras, right? Zebra stripes and a lot of other things. Basketball players have a uniform. And just because, just because I think that uh, you need to get this a little bit more, I have uh, coached soccer for a number of years. But even before that, I was refereeing soccer. And yes, Soccer referees have a uniform, just so you know, okay? So I'm going to show you some of the things that are in a uh, soccer uniform, okay? Referee, not player, because I am not that. So in AYSO United, which is the soccer program that I wear or play, when you get a basic referee course, you get this lovely yellow shirt. You can be seen from the moon with this thing. <laughs> it is phenomenal, okay? And just because for a few moments, you're going to get the, the bright visual, so close your eyes if you are sensitive to it, okay? All right, so you get this on. Oh, yeah, didn't mess up the microphone too bad, okay? If you progress, you move on to an intermediate one, and this one you can only see from California. It's not quite as bright. Okay, and uh, you progress and you pass the test and you get that one. If you progress even further, you get another. This is an advanced referee shirt for uh, for AYSO soccer. And this tells you that you are um, going to die in the summertime because <laughs> it is black and it's it's heavy. Okay. Um, the one thing that I didn't tell you that you need also, because this is my referee bag as well, you have to have all the other supplies that are necessary. So you have to have this little booklet. Fancy, isn't it? You have to have a yellow card. So when kids misbehave, you give them the yellow card very firmly and let them know that they need to get back in, in rank. If they mess up even more, you give them the red card and they are out. No more game for them. I haven't had to do that yet. I have had to do some yellow cards, right, Caleb? <laughs> and you have to have your badge. This is the badge that you put on your chest to let them know that you are an official referee. You have to have the pen in your pocket. You have to be ready to go. Oh, you can't do refereeing without this either because it's really, really important if you are the center referee and you have to have a whistle, okay? Now, one of the things that's unique about soccer is that the whistle is not like a basketball referee where they run around with the whistle in their mouth, okay? Because they're ready to call a foul. In soccer, you say, hmm, that might have been a foul. You think about it. Five minutes later, you blow the whistle <laughs> and you say, that was a foul. We're coming right back. Okay, uh, you have to have a coin to do a coin toss, and I have plenty of those because those are really cool. Um, anyways, you don't need to see a coin, but I have all the things that are necessary for me to be a referee, and I even have the sideline referee flag, wow. okay? Now, this flag, I know, Julie, you're impressed. Um, these flags are only used by the sideline referee to point when a ball has gone out of bounds and which direction it should go. Now, I won't give you the tutorial on how to do this, but it's really hard. You see the ball go out of bounds and it's supposed to go that way. You go, see, that's like super hard. But anyways, you have to have your 
suit of armor. You have to be suited up. And don't forget, don't forget, you have to have socks. Socks. They are the most amazing socks in the world that a referee has to wear. And they go all the way up to your knees like me when you're short because they, um, they're one size fits all. And that's horrible with your feet, too. So uh, when you have small feet like I do, it's just bad. And then you have to have your shoes so that you don't slip around on the field. Okay, this is important. And you have to have really short shorts. So (laughs) this stuff is really important. And we're not the only ones that suit up. Everyday heroes like nurses, doctors, policemen. Firefighters, suit up. You do it as well. Maybe at work, you have to suit up. Maybe it's as simple as having the proper attire for the day. Maybe it's the uniform at the restaurant that you work at or not wearing really casual clothes to your workplace. If you work in construction, you got to make sure that you have all the tools, right? If you're a mechanic, you have to have all the tools to be able to do your job. If you're retired, you've already suited up for a long time, and now it's time for you to not suit up. And there's nothing wrong with that. In this sermon series, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at uh, Ephesians chapter 6. A passage of scripture that is going to uh, talk to us about the armor of God, the, the armor that God wants us to wear daily to be able to withstand the work that is in front of us. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on, that is, suit up with the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly realms. At the end of this letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians is how he closes out his final instructions for the people of Ephesus. And Paul tells them to put on this full armor of God, and it makes us wonder what that's all about. Why would Paul tell us to put on the full armor of God? It's oddly specific, don't you think? Why does Paul talk about this of all the things that he could talk about? And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be unpacking the various aspects of the list that the Apostle Paul talks about and describes, because each, hear me on this one, each of those items has a purpose, just like each of these items has a purpose oddly specific for why you have that, have it. You see, no soccer team wants to have this color So you want this color to be worn by the referee so that it can be seen and the game can be called properly, okay? Now, if a team actually got close to it, that's why you have the other colors so that you can be seen on the field. See, each armor piece is important. We are given an understanding of what they are like. And I think that over the course of the next number of weeks, we will begin to unpack each one, describe it and why it's important to us and why we should be practicing this idea of put on the armor of God every single day. Because Paul understood something about the world, the world that he lived in and in the world that we live in. He understood there is something going on, that there is a supernatural battle that is taking place and it's being waged. And we have to be ready for it because we can't stand up on our own two feet by ourselves, no matter how hard we try. And we try hard, don't we? We try to stand up in the battles that are waged. And many times we get knocked down because we are trying to work it out in our own strength. 
And we are easily, easily overmatched by a lot of things. And I'm not just talking about the supernatural battles that we face every day. Some of the physical battles that we face, we are overmatched. So we're going to work through these. We're going to study them. We're going to talk about why they matter. What is the purpose of the belt of truth? What is the reason for the shield? What is the reason for the helmet? And I think, I think that no matter what stage of life you are in, this will have an impact. This will speak, and it will be something that I think that you want to, will hold, want to hold on to. So that's what we're going to do. But we need to have a little bit of understanding about this letter to begin with. Okay, so I'm going to give you some Cliff Notes version of this letter. Um, and uh, so here we go. Okay, first of all, Ephesians is considered the whole book or the whole letter of Ephesians. Ephesians is considered the most concise theological book in the Bible. It's small, but theologically it is rich. And it's an essential letter, not only for theology, but for also practicality as well. It's a manual of theology and a manual of practicality. And each one is really important. You, we need to know the theological precepts behind it, but we also need to know how to do it, how to live it out. And this letter does that. And so we'll be touching back and forth on it as we go. And that's going to be really important. But I would encourage you this week, maybe this week is uh, your time to start reading the book of Ephesians to kind of kick our, our series off. There's a guy by the name of Mark Holmes who wrote in a commentary about Ephesians. And he says this, if there were ever an owner's manual for Christians, the Ephesians letter would be it, complete with background, so to proper understanding of the experience, specific instructions to the daily operation and function of each follower. Paul reveals, catch this, Paul reveals the heart of God, the obedience of the Son, and the sustaining power of the Holy Spirit, and the faithful apostle called to share God's goodness with Gentile people. This letter reveals the heart of God, the obedience of the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit. If you ever want to know what Trinitarian theology is about, this is it. This is the book because it describes the three aspects of the triune God extremely well. So, with that in mind, there's a couple of thoughts that I want to just share with you about the, the city of Ephesus. Uh, first of all, it was a major metropolitan city. Uh, it was a port city. It was very diverse in population and very much an ethnically diverse community. Uh, and within the city of, uh, of Ephesus, it, it housed one of the seven wonders of the world. And if you can name all seven of them, um, pen a rose on your nose. That's awesome. But the one that they were talking about at that point in time was the, uh, the temple that was built to honor the Greek goddess Artemis. Now, you should know that the city of Ephesus would not have been friendly to Christians at that point in time. Christians were seen as a threat. Uh, they were seen as people that uh, were different, and they shouldn't have uh, been doing what they were doing. Now, the letter can actually be divided into two parts, okay? The first part is chapters 1 through 3 that are very theological. That's where you get all of the different facets of theology in there. Um, it does an amazing job of explaining salvation in the very first portions of the letter. Um, and you need to know that when Paul talks about salvation, he's not talking about it as an afterthought. He's not saying that God was surprised with the issue of salvation, but that it was planned. It was something that was planned all along by God, and this salvation is extended beyond the typical, what they would consider to be the Israelites, all the way to the Gentiles, people that were not Jewish, and this included everybody. And as I already talked about, it was Trinitarian in nature. Now, chapters 4 through 6 gives us a daily living type of scenario. 
uh, reminds us that we are worthy of a new life in Jesus. Catch that. We are worthy of a new life in Jesus. And so it's not just like, oh, great, you experienced salvation. No, it's you're worthy of it. You receive it and receive it well because that is what God's plan was all along to have you come into relationship with him. Um, when the other thing that it does is it tells us that we are to no longer live as Gentiles, to no longer live the way that we once were and to live as new creatures, new creation. And one of our responsibilities as a new creation is to reveal Jesus to the world. Don't miss that. Reveal Jesus to the world. Our lives are to be lived in love as Jesus loved. Wisdom will, will replace folly and practical ways are given within this letter as a way to live our lives to glorify Jesus. So there's my challenge for you. This week is to, maybe you don't have to, re, don't read the whole thing, okay? But maybe read a chapter. Maybe begin with chapter one and just allow it to ruminate all this week. You can read chapter 6 and get through ten uh, verses 10 and following and catch that and get the big picture. But the idea is this letter is rich, and so we want to catch it. Okay, Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. I want you to catch this as I kind of uh, move to wrapping up. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, catch this. At the very beginning, it says, be strong. And this isn't just a suggestion. It's not. It's a command. It's not just a good thought. It's not just a recommendation, but it's maybe something that you should realize that is commanded of us to be strong. And it's not just something that is common to Paul, but in fact, this type of command goes back all the way to the beginning. And here are just some passages that I think you might recognize that are really important to remind us that, that more people than just Paul says, be strong. In Joshua, verse 1, 7, it says, be strong and very courageous. Be very careful to obey all the laws my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Be strong. Be very courageous. And so this is a command by God that that is what we should do. Verse uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, it says, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. So not only is... Paul saying, find strength in God, be strong. Samuel experienced it. Samuel pursued it. I'm sorry, that's David. Samuel's the guy who wrote the book. David is pursuing strength in God. He's going after it. He's, he found it, strength in God. And then Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Be strong and be courageous. Take heart and wait. Now, when we wait, do you think that we're experiencing strength? A renewing strength, actually, when we're waiting in the Lord. Zechariah 10, 12, the Lord says this, I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in His name they will live securely. God says that he will strengthen us. And so 
we need to be strong. We need to be strong in how we wait for the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. But Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, this is one of his uh, couple of prayers that he utters for the people of, of Ephesus. And he says this, I, I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, an incomparably great power for us who believe that now is this, that, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. This is the strength that Paul is talking about. The, the strength that comes, the strength that is exerted by God when he, ra- when he raised Jesus from the dead. That this power would be for us. So we stand strong in this same power. And Ephesians 3.16 if, there's, if, you, if you know John 3.16, pick this one up because you already know 3.16. So Ephesians 3.16, I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through this Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I, I hope you're catching what I'm throwing down here because it's important to understand this theme that Paul is commanding, that David is commanding, that the psalmist is really strongly commanding and the prophets are declaring and God in his providence is reminding that strength is important, but strength in him. So you strengthen ourselves, we strengthen ourselves in God Almighty, and there's a reason for it. The reason is that we can stand. Let's look again at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We strengthen ourselves so that we can stand. Not lie down. Not sit not do anything else, not to fight on our own, not to rage or wage war or to charge the hill. And when I wrote that, I want to be honest with you, I was thinking of Teddy Roosevelt charging up San Juan Hill. And it's not that, but it is to stand, stand in the strength of God. And the only way that we can stand is by putting on the full armor of God. But why? Why do we need this full armor of God? The devil's schemes. See, we don't like to necessarily think about the supernatural world. We don't It's so different. We have a hard time understanding what it's all about. But we live both in a physical and a spiritual world. And we face attacks by a very real opposer. An evil one. Satan, the devil, the fallen angel that defied God. And we need to be able to withstand the battle that is coming. Actually, it's already here. You've experienced it every day of your life, but what we don't realize is that we can stand. We don't fight the battle on our own, but we stand by being fully armored in the armor of God, ready to stand, ready to withhold the battle ready to do what God has called us to because of His great work in us. So I wonder, over the next couple of weeks, will will you be willing to dive in with me 
and look at these passages of scriptures? Will you be willing to allow yourself to see that the word of God gives us the power and the authority to not only be able to stand, but stand in the strength of God? Because without the ability to stand, you know what we will end up doing? We will fall. We will cave. We will allow the enemy to overrun us. We will give in to the things that we know are true. We will compromise. And I don't think that's what God wants for us. I don't think God wants us to compromise His Word. I don't think God wants us to give in to the world's ways, but to stand on the truth that is God's Word so that you and I can stand up against the devil's schemes. I'm going to invite you to just close your eyes and I'm going to read this passage of Scripture for just a moment and then the the worship team, if you want to come all on up and we'll uh, uh, get ready to, to worship once I finish reading. But just allow these words of God to roll over you and wash you anew. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of the heaven, evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you stand, after you've done everything to stand, standing firm then with the belt of truth around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flames flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. We keep this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Father, as we close out our time together today, we realize that there is a a war that is being waged around us. There is a battle that is being fought And we don't have the eyes to see it. We don't have the ears to hear it. But by your word, we know that there is an onslaught that is happening. And so I pray that we would have the courage to at least begin to understand that we have to be able to stand. That the world and the the devil's work is so ready to wage war. And it already is. And so, God, I pray that we would have the ability to stand on your word and your truth and that your grace and mercy would hold us up in your righteous right hand. And we pray, Father, that this would not just be the day that we hear about your armor, but that we would come back week after week so that you would speak to us and guide us. We pray, Father, in all these things that your grace would stand and you would give us the strength that we need. We pray all this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today. Won't you please let's stand and we'll sing together.